Vamos começar, para não atrasar muito. Meu nome é Denis Antoniali, para quem não me conhece. É, eu coordeno aqui na faculdade uma atividade de cultura e extensão que se chama NDIS, Núcleo de Direito e Internet e Sociedade, que é supervisionado pelo professor Vigílio Afonso da Silva, que está aqui também. É, o NDIS existe desde 2012 aqui na faculdade, é um espaço de discussão e formação sobre temas ligados a direitos e políticas de internet. Né? Então a gente discute ah, várias dessas questões que passam por tutela de direitos fundamentais da internet, ah, pela sociologia jurídica, pelos posicionamentos e argumentos da construção de políticas públicas que tem a ver com tecnologia aqui no Brasil. Né? Ah, Além disso, esse evento é apoiado pela Internet Lab. A Internet Lab é um centro independente uh, de pesquisa em Direito e Tecnologia, uh, do qual eu sou diretor, junto com o Chico, que não está aqui, mas estava aqui também. Uh, tem algumas pessoas do Internet Lab aqui, a Nathalie Fragoso, que é da nossa área de privacidade e vigilância, a Esther, nossa estagiária de pesquisa, acho que só. É... E, e na Internet Lab a gente desenvolve uma série de projetos também ligados a esses temas. Né? E uh, a gente tem uh, o costume de, no Internet Lab, uh, promover algumas entrevistas quando a gente recebe uh, especialistas uh, e, e estudiosos internacionais, ativistas. Uh, e a gente geralmente faz isso uh, gravado, uh, mas num ambiente fechado. Daí, dessa vez, a gente teve a ideia de gravar. Então, esse evento está sendo gravado, uh, depois ele vai ser disponibilizado. Uh, e fazer essa entrevista, essa conversa uh, de forma pública, aberta. Então, na verdade, esse encontro está servindo a, do, a dois propósitos, né? Essa uh, gravação, que depois vai ser disponibilizada, mas também essa conversa com quem está aqui presente uh, e deixar isso mais interativo e aberto ao público. Né? Dito isso, eu queria agradecer muito a, a presença do Dave Maas, uh, o Dave trabalha na Electronic Frontier Foundation, que é uma organização dos Estados Unidos que trabalha com direitos digitais. E o Malte Spitz, que é um político alemão do Partido Verde, tem uma tradição e um histórico uh, de ativismo uh, nas políticas de direitos digitais, especialmente no que diz respeito ao direito à privacidade. Uh, e a gente vai ter o prazer de ouvir um pouco sobre as experiências e estratégias de ativismo uh, na questão da vigilância nesses dois países, né, nesses dois contextos, Estados Unidos e Alemanha. É, eu pedi, ou na verdade eu não pedi, para que eles fizessem ou preparassem uma apresentação. A ideia é que seja uma conversa desde o começo. Né? Ah, mas eu vou colocar como primeira pergunta, vamos dizer assim, para que eles se apresentem um pouco, e aí eu gostaria que eles falassem ah, também como eles entraram uh, nesse assunto, como é que eles se interessaram por esse tema, uh, o que chamou a atenção no começo, uh, e aí falar um pouco do trabalho deles, o que eles têm feito, apresentar isso em linhas gerais, acho que a gente pode começar daí, até porque eu não fiz uma apresentação muito uh, detalhada do currículo deles, e eu acho que eles podem fazer isso eles mesmos. Uh, em termos de língua, é, eu vou falar português, vocês podem falar português, ah, ah, a gente tem uma tradutora aqui ah, fazendo a tradução simultânea para eles, do português para o inglês, eles vão falar inglês ah, e aí não vai ter a tradução em seguida, para não ficar muito repetitivo. Ah, se, tiver ficando, se tiver alguma dificuldade, a gente traduz o que tiver sido difícil de entender, etc. Fique à vontade também para pedir ah, algum esclarecimento se alguma coisa não ficar clara. Tá bom? Então tá bom, então com isso eu vou passar a palavra para o Dave, para que ele se apresente melhor no trabalho dele. Obrigado de novo. Excelente. Então, eu estou começando por falar sobre como eu entrei nisso e depois vamos passar a falar um pouco mais em detalhe. Como você começou e o que você está fazendo? Entendi. Ok, então so meu nome é Dave Moss, eu sou um senior investigative researcher at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, I've been at EFF for six years now, but uh, my interest in this area and my work in this area goes back maybe a couple decades now. Um, I was a journalist for many years working in the American Southwest, and I also studied uh, uh, social anthropology as part of my master's degree, uh, working on issues related to technology, but also related to criminal justice. Um, at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, I'm part of a new team called the Threat Lab. 
and we are a small team that does uh, deep investigations into surveillance technology and how they impact society, but also how they're abused uh, to target individuals. Um, so my colleagues will work on issues related to um, what we call stalkerware, which is software that is used, um, usually it's kind of a form of domestic violence. Um, a partner might put it on their ex's phone in order to spy on them. I have a colleague who works on fake cell phone towers called cell site simulators, which uh, law enforcement uses to track people's phones, and he's building a device that uh, can detect them. Um, I work almost exclusively on law enforcement surveillance issues. Uh, that's generally domestic law enforcement surveillance. Uh, we like to call it street level surveillance because uh, it is the type of thing that uh, police are deploying in communities and that not necessarily the national security apparatus uses, but things that you know anywhere from a small town cop to a large city might acquire to uh, spy on communities or use for investigative matters. And so that might include things like drones or body-worn cameras or license plate readers, which is the number one thing that I found I've been spending my time on lately. And I can go into that in depth later, maybe during the question period. Uh, but the way we go about this, or at least how I go about this, is generally through a lot of journalistic techniques. So I file a lot of Freedom of Information Act requests. So these are requests that you can file in the US uh, with state or city or federal agencies to demand they provide you documents that they have have on various surveillance technologies. I, I also attend uh, police conferences uh, to gather intelligence on what police are, uh, are, you know, what is being sold to police. And uh, a lot of the time I go through um, government purchasing records. So the logs of what people are spending money on in government in order to find surveillance that might have been otherwise secret. Um, I'm also a visiting professor at the uh, Reynolds School of Journalism at the University of Nevada in Reno, um, where I lecture on cybersecurity surveillance and uh, journalism. And we're currently involved in a project where we are working with a large number of students to have them do small bits of research uh, gathering press releases and news articles and policy documents, basically anything they can find on the internet in order to create the first ever inventory of what police departments have throughout the country in the United States. And we just finished the first pilot project uh, this spring with 65 students in which we were gathering data along the uh, southwestern border because the U.S. border region along Mexico is probably one of the most contentious spaces right now in the United States. And so that's sort of a brief overview of what I'm working on. I could talk probably about another three hours, but um, I know that there's other people who want to talk, and I will pass it on right now. Does it work also? Yes, yes, yes. perfect. Uh, yeah, Malte Spitz, my name. I'm from Germany. Um, first thing, how I started. I started working on uh, digital rights issues in 2001, actually. Um, and it was first on issues like uh, copyright, video surveillance, open source uh, software, but then it was like more spe uh, like specialized more and more on all things related to privacy issues and uh, data protection. And I was a politician for almost uh, uh, 10 years, like a real uh, full-time politician, um, but, but it was important f for me of, uh, 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 of uh, you being an activist at the same time. So it's, this, is, this is, might be sometimes a, a little bit, a little bit uh, schizophrenic because on the one hand side you have to do party politics and on the other hand you have to be like part of civil society who is also even sometimes criticizing this um, but at the end I hope I'm still uh, it's uh, at the end I think it still worked out um, and so after finishing my political day-to-day -day life I started become an author and also 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 started an NGO, the, the GFF, the Society for, for Civil Rights, which is an NGO specialized on, on the issue of strategic litigation. It isn't only specialized on uh, digital rights issues, it's more specialized on 
human rights in general, but we are specializing in the field of digital rights. So I would say around 60% of our cases are somehow digital rights related from issues like uh, from issues like uh, governmental hacking, on issues like whistleblowing, on police uh, databases, and so on. So we have at the moment we in the last two and a half years we already filed around thirty five cases, almost half of them are constitutional complaints. In Germany we have the quite happy situation that you can that you can challenge laws directly at the constitutional court in some times and in some fields. Um, and so um, I think it's all fine now. But um, so um, No, 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 here. Just have to see if it goes. If so, I could show some slides. If not, I just talk about them. Um, yeah, sure. Ah. No. Ah, now it goes. Then I just have to start it. Da, 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 da. Give me a second. Just loading. Ah. It's green like the Green Party, but I think. Um, so, um, our NGO is like focusing on strategic litigation in the field of human rights. As I said, we have around now 30, 35 cases. I will just skip over some stuff. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Um, that we already had to talk about. So, and what our issue is that we are really only focusing on the you know, litigation work. So it's not that we are doing some actions, we are not doing petitions, we are not doing lobbying work at the parliament, we do no public campaigning for our cases. The idea is to enable other organizations or activists who are, who are already experts in their specific fields, like organizations who are really like uh, focusing on issues of governmental hacking, for example, or focusing on freedom of the uh, 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 press, that we help them to use legal means to reach their uh, 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 goals. So it's like a service NGO, you could say, so that NGOs or activists who have no legal expertise can uh, contact us and then, then we can help them to file a lawsuit. At the same time, it's all, all also sometimes, and that's, I would say even half of them, half of our cases are starting at our office where we see an issue which we say, it's pretty interesting case maybe, and then we are searching for possible partners, we are searching for plaintiffs. Um, and not to talk that much, I will just show you really briefly three, four short cases so that you get an idea of our work or of the work I do there. Um, this is Cecile. Cecile is an anti-nuclear activist. She's like a really peaceful activist, just climbing up on uh, your bridges, buildings and so on to stop to uh, stop for example nuclear waste transports but even if she's a, like a really peaceful activist she is handled in the police databases as a relevant person 
And this means under, under German law, if you are uh, targeted as a relevant person, you are somehow like a terrorist. <laughs> and so the police can use secret surveillance mechanisms. And it was important for us to, to, to have a case showing that even laws, where it was said this is only new laws for terrorism, for organized crime, that those laws can also apply to peaceful climbing activists and uh, therefore we are helping Cecile to, to uh, know about what is the police uh, doing uh, against her. Second case, which is uh, also a case where you have to think first about to understand a, a little bit the background maybe. Hermann is a really old school type of uh, peace activist and he is handing out leaflets in, uh, in front of the companies who are producing weapons and are selling those weapons to foreign countries. And he's asking in this leaflet that the employees of those companies are becoming whistleblowers to show the public that there, there are maybe illegal arms rates, for example. And in Germany, it's a little bit unclear if this uh, calling to leak to trade secrets from this company, if this is legal or if this type of uh, whistleblowing is completely fine. And in the first instance, of course, Hermann always was sentenced to some uh, fine. So he had to pay 1,000 euros, 3,000 euros. And so we are helping him to go to higher instances court to, re to re review this decision and we just got a second ruling today, as, as this uh, morning in Germany, where, where, the, where the court has decided that what he is doing isn't illegal and they overturned the decision from the, from the first instance court and so that they made clear that whistleblowing is, isn't a, a crime and also not asking to become a, a, a whistleblower is also not a crime. And the third case, and then I'm saying I, 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 I gave you an overview of our work, is a bio, 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 biometric pictures. In Germany, it's uh, like uh, you are obliged as a citizen to, to have an ID card, and uh, this ID card has to have a bio, biometric picture of you on your ID card. And now there is a new law which allows the law enforcement agencies, but also the intelligence agencies. And in Germany, we have intelligence agencies for inside Germany and also like uh, foreign intelligence that they have automated access to, the, to uh, these uh, databases and there is no there are no log files if the police, if the intelligence agencies have had uh, like access those pictures, if all of them or only uh, like, uh, or like of specific persons, so it's completely unclear. Um, and we are challenging this law and, and also uh, this opportunity of access of, of these pictures because we are thinking that they are using this way to train their systems on automated f facial recognition. Because in Germany it becomes more and more popular and we already had the first, uh, we had the first public testing systems of automated facial recognition by the federal police. And so we think that they will use this to just like explore more into that way. And, and uh, this, is, this is a thing where we say it's unconstitutional to use your photo ID pictures uh, to, to, uh, uh, to uh, use it as a, as a 
training data for automated facial recognition systems. It's a case where we hopefully have a decision by the Constitutional Court maybe uh, end of 2020, early 2021. Um, it always takes some time in Germany, uh, but we are quite optimistic that the Constitutional Court is over ruling this law. Like that. Thanks. Eu queria deixar isso bem interativo, então quem tiver perguntas já fique à vontade para fazê-las. Eu tenho algumas, mas acho que eu vou deixar vocês começarem. Do que eles falaram e do que vocês trouxeram, pensaram, reações, perguntas iniciais. Eu não sei se a gente é melhor fazer a pergunta no microfone, talvez, porque a gente está gravando. Eu levo aí, não tem problema. some questions for you both and I was expecting to understand how you overcome the challenges associated to gathering evidence for the cases. For example, I don't know, how did you find out uh, that Cecil was a relevant person to the police in Germany? Because I guess we have to deal with Brazil too with a lot of rumors on social leaderships being monitored but I guess the first challenge is to present it as a fact and not as a rumor or something like that. And other than that, I guess also, I, if you talk about the investi investigative work uh, by monitoring the purchase, and I guess that would be very interesting for us, for example, I guess first we are having to deal with the technology and then with the regulation. For example, a lot of drones are being purchased by the government of Sao Paulo and there's no regulation on the topic. And I'd like to hear a little bit more about that exercise that you do with your students in gathering evidence of surveys and technologies with or without regulations on the topic. Do you want to start with you? Sure. Uh, plaintiff search and also how to uh, find cases it's really there is no clear pro, uh, pro uh, procedure actually for us. There are there are some cases where the plaintiffs are uh, uh, are uh, you coming to us? That was the case with uh, Cecile, where uh, where she and her her uh, uh, lawyer came to us and asked us for help because they knew that she has some sort of police database entries, but they were a little bit unclear how far reaching it was, and so they asked us kind of for help on that case. Um, there are some cases where, as I said, we are doing more like case uh, uh, building, where we really like just have an abstract issue we say, okay, this is a problem. For example, governmental hacking. So there was a law in Germany introduced 2017, which allowed the federal police to use governmental hacking for 30 different crimes. And so there was a new law, there was an issue, governmental hacking, where we said, ah, oh, it's a little bit difficult. And then we uh, talked to some uh, partner organizations and searched for plaintiffs who have been affected by hacking from states or, or even like from activist group. And in that case, we had like a journalist who is living in exile in Germany. We had a German journalist who was covering, uh, who was covering especially, who was covering especially state-sponsored uh, uh, doping in a, in a. Russia, so he got also quite often attacked 
by r r Russian authorities by hacking his computer, for example. And we were arguing in, in that case, if the German state also uses governmental hacking technologies, that this is lowering the general protection of everyone, and this is a harm to our plaintiffs who are journalists in that example. And so we are asking that at least the German state cannot use uh, uh, zero-day exploits for governmental hacking, because if they have a zero days, they are kind of withholding um, backdoor types uh, like to different operating systems and those uh, zero days could be also used by uh, other countries to attack our plaintiffs. So it's more like a creative way of argumentation um, but we think, or we hope at least, that, this, that the Constitutional Court will some, say somehow that at least the state has to do some sort of uh, vulner vulnerability management so that they cannot withhold such, uh, 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 that they cannot withhold such zero days, but that they have to at least report them to the manufacturers of those uh, operating systems, for example. But finding really good plaintiffs is uh, taking sometimes years even. So we have a case now where we are really searching for plaintiffs now for one, one and a half years. So it's not easy to find a good plaintiff uh, and to behind an issue, you, 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 I think you just have to be interested in law and how uh, 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 policy making goes and there you often find some issues where you think this could be interesting to, to, to go after for. No. <coughs> so, uh, so I find your question really interesting because this is a, uh, an issue we run into all the time. I, I like to refer to uh, surveillance abuses as invisible civil rights violations. I think that normal, oh, sorry, normally with civil rights violations, people know when they've been beat up by the cops. People know when they've been arrested on no charges. People know when these things happen to them, but they don't necessarily know when a cop has gone rifling through their records or when somebody has invaded their computer or when they keep getting pulled over for, you know, for no apparent reason and they don't know why they keep getting pulled over and it's because this is just totally invisible. Um, and, you know, the, oftentimes how police are using surveillance technology is secret and it's secret by intent in that police will not put the use of a technology in their police reports on purpose or they will be told to use the technology and then once they have the information come up with another plausible way that they could have come across that information in order to protect the existence of the technology. Um, but oftentimes the fact that they have the technology or not is not a secret. Um, did anybody watch the TV show The Wire? It was on HBO many years ago. So there's this line in The Wire where one of this cop is like, you know, uh, if you follow the drugs, you just get like, you know, I think you just get drug dealers. But if you follow the money, you don't know where it's going to lead. And, I, and I, I like to think of that because it's very hard for governments to hide how they spend money. There are receipts. There are contracts. And so oftentimes we'll start looking at surveillance by starting with where are they spending the money, trying to get the contracts for how they're buying things, and maybe we won't find out how it's used, but at least it's a start to know that they have it. And from there, we can kind of dig in. Um, one of the techniques that I use to try to uncover how police might be abusing surveillance is to imagine if I was evil, um, and to pretend like I'm evil, and how would I go about violating somebody's rights? And it's a thought exercise that 
because if I can think of it, and I am not a trained police officer, it is not my day-to-day -day job, but if I can think of it, then there are at least 10 police officers who thought about it first and are probably acting upon it. So to give you an example of you know, my thinking on this, um, license plate readers. These are um, cameras that are either attached to stoplights or highway overpasses uh, to capture the plates of cars that go past, or they're attached to police cars, so when police are canvassing neighborhoods, they're collecting data on people. And that gets uploaded to a database, and that's searchable. And so, you know, one of the, the contentious issues right now in the U.S. is immigration enforcement. And I, so I start playing with mine. If I was, you know, part of Donald Trump's deportation force and I wanted to catch as many immigrants as possible, what would I do with license plate readers? And the way I think about it is, okay, well, the first thing I would do is I would put in an address. I would look, go online and I would look up the location of uh, medical centers that cater to immigrants and law centers that cater to immigrants. And I would put in the addresses of those locations. And that license plate reader database would produce a series of license plates that are seen regularly at those locations. And I'm going to say to myself, okay, so these are people who are either people who work at this facility or people who visit the facility. Then what I can do is I can grab a few of those and I can put them into the system and then suddenly I see that this person who came here is at this other location five days a week during the day and he's at this other location at night five, you know, seven nights a week. And that lets me know where this person lives and where they go to work. On top of that, I'm like, okay, I want to now use the system. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to put in one person's license plate and I want it to tell me what other license plates were seen near that license plate. Um, so what cars are parked next to that car? And so once I get that list, then I've started to build out an entire community. I know where this person who I presume is an immigrant lives, and I know the vehicle of their spouse. And then I know where that person goes on Sundays, and that's their church, and that's their grandmother's house. And that might be how I sort of look across the entire system. Um, and so I might start pursuing it, investigating it that way, and if I might start talking to people, you know, lawyers, who deal with immigrants and they'll come to me and they'll say, hey, you know, they just picked up a bunch of people like at the courthouse when they showed up at the courthouse or they just happened to catch this person as they were showing up at their school. We don't know how they're finding these people and we still don't know how they're finding these people but based on, you know, my little thought exercise and what I know about license plate readers, it is entirely consistent with that use of technology and we know through procurement records that ICE, you know, the immigration authorities have purchased access to this data that has all those capabilities. So that's kind of how like the, the, the circle of my thinking goes, at least on this particular technology. Um, other things that we might do um, are uh, uh, look at police disciplinary records. Um, you know, in California, we passed a law recently that requires a lot of police disciplinary records to be made public. And generally, when journalists look at this, these records, they're looking at police shootings, they're looking at police brutality, they're looking at police sexual assault. What they're not necessarily looking at close at is police who are abusing databases to, you know, go after their spouses, or maybe they're having a dispute with a neighbor, or maybe their cops are uh, on the payroll of a criminal enterprise and are grabbing data and then selling it, which happens. And so you can find out information that way. Um, we'll often go through court records, um, you know, quite a bit. You know, when we hear from, you know, calling up public defenders and saying, like, hey, have you heard about this technology being used? And then they'll tell us and we'll go dig through the court records and we'll see, you know, this unit within a police department was involved in this case. Let's look at other cases that involved this particular police unit that has access to this technology. Um, and another thing that we do is uh, file massive amounts of public records requests in a very systematic way. And it's kind of like, did the, the, the video, did the game, um, the board game Battleship, like, is that something that, that is in Brazil? Okay, so you're familiar with this. I mean, if you're under a certain age, you probably don't because you're just playing video games, but what's that? But there was a movie with like Rihanna in it, like based on it. But, <laughs> but the, the idea is, is that this is a game where you don't know what the other person's battleships are and you call out a number and they tell you whether they hit it or not. And if you hit it, then you keep going around. So you kind of play that game with public records requests where you might find an agency and you might file a request and be like, I'm not sure whether you have this technology or not, 
but I'm going to ask for all your records about the technology. And then you either have to tell me you don't have it or you do have it. And then once I find somebody who does have it, then I'm like, OK, well, you've given me these records. Now I want all these other records. And maybe I get lucky and I get a copy of an instruction manual. So with license plate readers, we got lucky and we got a copy of the actual you know, manual that the person who manages the system like, has to follow. And once we started reading that manual, we learned what kind of data could be exported from this system. And so we were able to very easily figure out how to find out how many license plates were captured by this piece of software and how to export uh, who they're sharing it with and who's sharing it with them. And these were two very standard documents that you could export from the system. And so once we had those two things, we knew we could easily get those two pieces of information. We started filing hundred, we we're in the process of filing a thousand records requests across the country. We filed about five or 600 now. Um, only about 200 of those 500 agencies have produced records, which is actually a pretty good hit rate for us. But you know, it's, you know, and so now we're able to gather all this information to compare departments and be like, okay, you know, on average, only you know, 0.05% or 0.5% of license plates are actually useful in an investigation, and the most are not. Or you'll find out that an agency in California is sharing with 900 agencies around the country, or they're sharing it with folks in New York City, or they're sharing it with folks in Hawaii. I don't know how many cars are making it from New York to Hawaii, but you know, they're sharing data anyways. Um, but yeah, it's this kind of, this game of like battleship or, or another card game like called Go Fish or something, you know, of trying to, you know, keep this process going where you ask for records, you get records, you use those records to ask for more records and so on and so forth until you find uh, the, the tr you follow the trail and see where it leads you. Ouvindo essas iniciativas, essas estratégias que vocês adotaram, eu queria que vocês comentassem um pouco é, como é a recepção da opinião pública ou até mesmo do judiciário, nos casos que são judicializados, em relação a esses temas. Né? É, o Dave comentou um pouco dessa é, ideia de seguir o dinheiro e investigar, e você pode descobrir coisas grandes. É, eu acho que isso está bem ligado a uma das narrativas aqui no Brasil, Uh, que tem legitimado muita atuação da polícia, do Ministério Público, das autoridades de investigação em geral, uh, de combate à corrupção, combate ao crime, manutenção da ordem, uh, e isso angariou, uh, na opinião pública, bastante apoio em relação às capacidades de vigilância, capacidade de investigação uh, dessas autoridades. E aí eu queria perguntar como é que a opinião pública em geral uh, se posiciona. Então, o Dave, por exemplo, estava comentando que muitas das estratégias estão ligadas à ideia de transparência. Né? Então, a partir do momento que eu descubro que isso está sendo feito, eu coloco isso no debate público, eventualmente isso pode gerar uma discussão mais aprofundada. É... Isso depende um pouco de uma conscientização ou uh, de uma preocupação por parte da sociedade em relação a essas questões. Né? E aí eu queria perguntar uh, como é isso nos Estados Unidos, como é isso na Alemanha, como é o, a opinião pública tem uh, se posicionado em relação às justificativas que são dadas uh, e o judiciário também nos casos que foram judicializados. Sure. Um, so one of the things we find is that law enforcement, when they're trying to buy this technology and sell it on the public, is they come in and they use two general cases. They're terrorists and pedophiles. That's like the two things. They're like, we need this technology because we got to stop a bombing, or we need to get this technology because we need to stop people who are selling child porn online. And neither of those are actually the use cases that they end up using it for. Uh, we see them usher it in that way. Uh, what they'll end up doing it is using, so uh, again, the, the example of license plate readers, the number one use of license plate readers is actually finding stolen cars. That's like the number one thing. Even though they're like saying it's for terrorism or for uh, what we call an amber alert, which is when a kid has been kidnapped and they want to capture, find the kid real quick, they put on an amber alert. Um, but what you see is that it, it, it definitely ends up getting used for very basic uh, investigations or even things that maybe aren't even crimes. So with license plate readers, they're sold on all these other crimes. What do we find they're used for? To like, 
research where people who are receiving food stamps in the US. Like you'll have an agency that gives out food stamps and they just use it routinely to look up these people who are receiving government benefits to see whether they, you know, where they're going. Do they actually have a job or do they not have a job? Do they live alone or do they not live alone? It's for very low level things. Um, you know, very famously cell site simulators, these cell phone tracking things, oftentimes it's terrorist, terrorist, terrorist. We gotta be able to catch that bomber in real time. They use it, you know, we've seen it used for like somebody stole money from like a pizza delivery person and they used it to track that person. Like it's that very basic and silly. Um, I think that the, there's been a huge shift in public opinion um, you know, around the 2016 election. I think prior to the election there was, well there was like a series of shifts. So the, the, the Snowden revelations changed everything. Suddenly the Snowden revelations dominated headlines for a while. People thought about privacy and, and surveillance in a totally different way. You know, the media was covering it all the time. And so we started to see a lot of progress on surveillance issues. Um, then Trump was elected and suddenly there were battles to fight on so many other fronts that surveillance has kind of taken a little bit of a backseat because people are worried about, you know, are we gonna be rounding up Muslims in the US? Are we gonna be like rolling back protections for gay people or transgender people? What are we gonna do about immigrants? And so there's this huge other range of battles that we have to fight all over the place. And what I need to you know, explain to people during these, uh, these discussions is that uh, surveillance intersects with all of them, that surveillance is part of all of this. And so if you're going to be you know, worrying about you know, the Black Lives Matter movement or you're gonna be worrying about immigrants or you're gonna worry about the transgender community, surveillance is like across the board something that has to be dealt with with that. Um, uh, the, the Facebook scandals over the last year have also increased a lot of public perception about surveillance, but it's been more about um, corporate surveillance and what uh, uh, the you know, companies are collecting us and people stopped caring as much about the government. But like my friend here has pointed out every time I've said this, <laughs> and I'm gonna steal it from you now, is that, is that when companies are collecting this data, that data is stuff that can be obtained by the government. And there's this kind of uh, uh, you know, sketchy argument the government will, be ma will make. Well, like, well, we'll not collect this data. We'll just require the companies to collect this data and hold on to it so we can get it later. Um, but it's the same difference. It's not, there's not much of a, of a change in that regard. Um, the, the one thing, though, one of the other big differences over the last couple of years, at least how I message on this, is that we used to talk about surveillance in a very individualized way, like, you know, what do they have on you? Don't you like your rights? Like, isn't it creepy they're spying on you? How do you feel about it? And, you know, people will come back and say, well, if I've got nothing to worry about, why do I have to like, you know, if I've got nothing to hide, then I've got nothing to worry about. Um, and we, you know, you, you try to make arguments with them, but, um, what has changed recently with what we now know about disinformation campaigns, what we now know about some of these big data algorithms, is that um, it's more of a team sport now. That if you're, even if you have nothing to worry about, if you're contributing data and you are, you are being collected by uh, governments or companies, uh, then that creates a system that can, be, can manipulate society as a whole. Um, and so we need to all sort of care about it because even if you don't see any individual risk, you need to appreciate that there's a risk to society overall. Um, there's a, there's a, um, a, a research project out of um, an agency called the IARPA, uh, IARPA, it's the Intelligence Agency's Research, it's, anyways, I can't remember the, their long acronym, but it's an intelligence research uh, organization uh, within the Department of Defense. Um, and they are actively investigating um, whether if they collect all of this, uh, what's called signals intelligence from the Middle East, along with all the social media data, you know, can people predict civil unrest? And that, can they, I mean, it's like troop movements, uh, the spread of disease, but civil unrest. And civil unrest is the one that really worries me because if they're able to gather all this data and start predicting what is going to create you know, political unrest, then they are starting to able to be, you know, uh, design ways to create civil unrest in a foreign country and, or even internally. And that really kind of worries me. We all need to be, you know, mindful that the future of our society is at stake if we're all contributing data to the system. Um, I have to say for a smaller NGO and an NGO who isn't like the EFF now 30 years old? How old is EFF? Uh, are, 32? Uh, it's 1990, so that makes us uh, 20, 29. 29 years old? 29. We, have, uh, we have our first two employees who are younger than the organization now. Okay. 
uh, and as an NGO who is now maybe three years old, I have to say, uh, public opinion isn't uh, like having cases who are like uh, get support by the majority. <laughs> it isn't really necessary for us. But I would also have to say that a case where we know that maybe 1% of public opinion is only in a favor for us, that this is, I think, for a smaller, younger NGO quite difficult. Like, for example, a case which the ACLU in the United United States would maybe take on a really controversial issue in public. I think as a, as a younger NGO it's more d difficult. I have to say so it's maybe changing in five to ten years if we are more as established and if we just can have a smile on it but as a like, like smaller NGO the public opinion is an issue for us, but it's not an, uh, an issue where we say it's a deal breaker for us. So if there is an issue with where we know it's maybe only 30% of society uh, sees the case uh, 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 similar as us, it's okay. But it's like only 1% or maybe 3% or maybe 8%, I think it's more c critical for us. And, but I have to say, in general, in Germany, the like first of all, s first of all, s s strategic litigation for human rights in the national context has no history in Germany. There hasn't been NGOs for the last 30, 40 years who have who have done something similar as the GFF does. So there is no real history where we can build upon it. At the same time, we have the positive situation that there is still a huge majority in Germany who believes in uh, human rights, who believes in the constitution, who, who believes in the ju uh, judiciary. So it's not something controversial to use legal to use legal means to. A, a fight for something. So, it's, so even the most conservatives want the right-wing extremists <laughs> even in, in German politics, they are still accepting the decisions by the Constitutional Court. So there is no, there is no questioning there hasn't been really, really, there hasn't been really, 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 really scandals over the last years around the Constitutional Court. So this is quite helpful for us because, therefore, like the ordinary German citizen is just thinking, okay, GFF is just holding up our Constitution. And so it's something where most of the people are quite optimistic and so supportive, which is f for sure helpful for us. Um, and so we get quite a lot of we get quite a lot of uh, feedback on our cases from the general public. Um, and so, therefore, I would say till till today, the public opinion is quite so supportive, at least. But as I said, really, really, really controversial cases may be at the moment a little bit difficult for us. But being in favor of constitutional rights is something where I would say 80, 85%, 90% of the German population says super work. So. Um, you, you just made me also think about, um, so I mean, I, I don't know how, how we're doing with the, uh, the general public in the larger space because I think that the you know, perpetual problem with the American public is that 
they're largely complacent in general and they don't vote in elections and they don't read the news. And so uh, I can't make them like, like I, I would love people to, everyone to care about our issues. I would love everyone to care about something. Um, and I don't know that there's a lot of people who actually care about something other than like spoilers in the new Avengers movie or something. <laughs> um, uh, but that said, uh, I try to look at the constituency that we can reach as people who care about things. And if you care about something, then surveillance is, and privacy is important to you. Um, we've been very lucky in the United States in that our issues have been embraced by both the left and the right. The moderates, maybe not so much, but left or right were great. Um, when we sued the NSA, um, uh, after the Snowden revelations, we had a long list of, of, of plaintiffs uh, that ranged from uh, environmental groups to gun rights groups. And that was by design because gun rights groups know, I mean, I don't necessarily have opinions that, that align with gun rights groups, but I know they care about their rights and they, that to them, surveillance is an issue. And the same on the environmentalist side. When we uh, were passing a, a bill in California to require law enforcement to get a warrant before they you know, get, uh, go to Facebook and try to get your records or try to get your email or try to use a cell site simulator to, to, to you know, track your phone, our two sponsors were uh, you know, polar opposites. We had one who was you know, the most liberal of the liberal San Francisco, like gay Democrat. He was just like the most, like known as like the most liberal in, in the entire California Senate. And then the other sponsor was as Tea Party, right wing, anti-immigrant, you know, you know, very Islamophobic even, but you know, from Southern California. But the two of them cared about things and they came together and they passed the bill. And so, you know, we were able to do that by building, by, you know, going to the sides that care and you know bring them together and so i think that that you know that's kind of where we have to go for public opinion is just looking towards the issues that people are interested in and then trying to make them connect with uh surveillance and privacy oh just a small add-on when it comes to the public opinion as i showed on the case with uh, uh, uh cecile i think it's also important that you search for uh, uh, plaintiffs where at least the the general public is uh, somehow open for. So that you have plaintiffs where uh, people would say, she isn't, uh, uh, she isn't uh, 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 a terrorist on the first hand. And who looks a little bit sympathetic and she is a girl, she's not that old, she is like from, she has this French accent. So it's something where people would say, why is, why is she in a poor, a poor, a poor a least d database? So really, I think plaintiffs are really helping you to attract a, a, a general audience, even if those are plaintiffs where the, where the, where the general population thinks, these people are, are a, a similar like I am, kind of. Because then you have a connection co to the plaintiffs, and uh, then you think, Okay, could uh, this also happen to uh, uh, me, for example? And then you have a con then the, then the whole uh, uh, discourse is changing because p people understand that those laws are affecting every one of us, and this is really helpful because then you get a much much more important support for your issue as if you are just talking in general on surveillance because people maybe even can I identify themselves with these plaintiffs. So therefore really plaintiff search is so important when you have cases uh, because it can help you for the next three, four, five years of your, uh, your legal battle in, uh, in uh, court. Perguntas, aquele tem uma, mas não. Bom, o microfone está aqui. Para atrapalhar a timidez também, a gente vai ter que manter o microfone no fio. Então, mas trabalhem, venham até aqui, pessoal. Entendeu? Vou aqui. É, Para continuar nesse tema um pouco, acho que seria interessante agregar uma pergunta relacionada a como combinar o litígio estratégico 
com estratégias de sensibilização da opinião pública em relação à, à ação. É, a EFF faz bastante isso e o, o Malte acabou passando os primeiros, os primeiros slides da apresentação dele. Eu acho que seria legal, não sei se todo mundo conhece, mas a, a, a ferramenta de visualização que ele criou a partir da, dos dados que ele recebeu da Deutsche Telekom e que, de fato, me parece algo muito interessante no sentido de as pessoas é, conseguirem entender o que, que aquilo tem a ver com elas ou os, os efeitos do que é, uma, uma quantidade massiva de dados sobre nós pode ter em relação ao que as pessoas sabem sobre nós. Então, um pouco sobre essas estratégias de sensibilização da opinião pública em torno dos temas que a gente também está tratando em litígio estratégico, mas que o é, um apoio da sociedade em torno deles faz, inclusive, com que a ação possa andar de uma forma melhor. Um, while well, 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 he's getting that ready. Um, So uh, I mentioned earlier um, about how we've been filing these, these public records requests massively across the country and doing you know, hundreds of these. And part of our thought on doing this is that we needed local reporters in like cities all over the country to have something to write about because they don't necessarily have you know, like top notch, I mean, it, it, I don't want to you know, denigrate you know, small town reporters, but they have a lot to cover and they're understaffed And they don't necessarily have, um, you know, the ability to go do week-long investigative reporting trainings around the country on surveillance issues. And so we wanted to gather this information for them to be able to have it on our site so that if you lived in some of these small towns or these mid-sized cities, there was something for you to write about, that we had produced that information and you could use that to dig deeper. Um, and so that was one thing, to be able to do it across the country like that. But bringing all that information together from so many different places, um, sort of created the, the fact base for uh, our legal team to be able to start arguing in court that there was so much data on people in this system that law enforcement should have to get a warrant before querying people's license plate reader data. And so I think that kind of speaks to your question a little bit. I can't go into like huge depth about a lot of our, our legal stuff because I'm a lawyer and the lawyer, not, I'm not a lawyer and the lawyers are like whispering in my ear like, Dave, you know, shut your mouth, don't talk about legal stuff. So um, I'll just go ahead and leave it there. I just have to restart the system a little bit. Just give me a second. Now, yeah. Now I think it will restart again. Just let me say something about the case and then I hopefully it's up again so I can show you the visualization. I uh, uh, filed a uh, lawsuit against Deutsche uh, Telekom in the years 2009, 2010 to get access to the so-called metadata they have on me. So uh, this was a time where I was still a, a politician but also somehow an activist. And so after I received this information, I decided to uh, uh, publish it and it was quite a lot of information like um, there was like a half year legal battle between Deutsche Telekom and me and at the end they said okay we will hand you all your uh, uh, metadata over and it was on an it was in an Excel sheet and it first just was an Excel sheet and I said oh my gosh all this work for this ugly Excel sheet Uh, but then after a couple of days uh, opening it up again and closing it and opening it up again, I realized that it was quite a lot of content. And it has been over 35,800 lines of individual information on me for half a year. And so after I saw that, I, I somehow realized that this is like a shadow of my life. It's like six months of my life in this uh, database because you could see every move I did for half a year. If I go up in the morning at six or at eight, if I go to a bed, if I go out to go 
uh, your parting, for example, and so on. And so after a couple of weeks, months actually, I decided to uh, publish it together with Zeit Online and they uh, visualized it. It's here like uh, you can see how I go by a high speed train from, this, from the city of uh, uh, Frankfurt to the city of Cologne, for example. And this is like the, like the uh, uh, and and you have also the possibility to uh, zoom in, so you can really see me in the city moving around on a like approximately fifty to eighty meters. Now, so you can see here that I'm in this building. Maybe you cannot see me if I'm in this room or in the room next door, as it would be maybe possible with a GPS. But at least you can see I'm in the building and they can also see it of all of you because all of you have some sort of smartphone or at least mobile phone with you and you can see in this map every time I have a phone call it blinks up if I get a short message and so on and um, yeah it was for me a quite quite an issue that that's a really big big view into my Private life into my in 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 intimacy, um, but I said that I think it's really important that people understand if they hear something abstract like mobile phone metadata collection, that they understand what this really means. And also, as I said, with the uh, uh, plaintiffs, if they see this, I'd, I was at this time 26 years old, they said, why do they have all this information on this guy? And when I said they have this information on all of you, they were like, oh my gosh. Um, and so this is, I think, something really helpful if you have ways to communicate uh, your work in a such easy way that people maybe understand for the first time what is really happening there. Because they often only hear there is a scandal, they have your data, they are collecting like your IP fingerprints online and all that stuff. But it isn't something which you can really realize and see and feel somehow. And uh, so the emotional uh, part of com Com communication on those issues of uh, 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 on those issues of uh, digital rights, I think, are really important because it opens up uh, for a lot of people their minds, and it makes them to feel even stronger on those issues. Because you cannot say, "Why are you so uh, stupid that you haven't?" known about all of this. 80, 80 90 percent of the whole society has no, has no clue about it. But I think that we also need to help them to understand and therefore it's important that for example journalists are really going into this work and really show people in an easy way with, with uh, different ways of uh, this, uh, with different ways of uh, storytelling what is happening here and I think this is something which really can happen globally that's nothing just specialized for the US or for Germany but this can really be done everywhere because you have such stories everywhere it is just some research some uh, uh, digging around asking around and then some sort of publications who help you to publish this. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask you something that you already uh, introduced right now about public awareness about s everything that's going on uh, and because I always have the feeling that many, many NGOs they are 
trying to to, to discover what the state is, uh, is, is doing and uh, what they're going to do next and so on. Uh, but I'd like to, to know if you're also interested in creating public awareness about everything, and not, not only to show what's going on, but also to, to kind of education, uh, do's and don'ts. So don't do this online, don't show this, don't, don't share this, etc. Of course, there, there are some things that you cannot control. You are on your mobile phone, so you cannot control what they're but uh, uh, you can control many things and people have no idea that they can control and they should control. So uh, if this is an issue for you. Uh, the second thing about uh, uh, plaintiff, I'm offered to an internet lab to be a plaintiff for a case about uh, uh, biometric ID. I'm not, uh, I, I don't have a French accent, but uh, I, think it, I think I'm a nice guy. <laughs> good, good, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and the third question is, uh, is kind of a curiosity about the uh, uh, court decision in Germany yesterday or the day before yesterday, no, in, in Saxony, about the drone. Uh, it's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, a guy was using his drone with the camera um, in the neighborhood and one of his neighbors simply just shut the drone down uh, because the camera and my daughter is playing in the, the backyard and you're recording and just shut them down and the court said it's all right you can shoot the drone down just so what are you um, so I'll, I'll talk about the uh, the education issue um, so we do have a resource on our website called uh, surveillance self-defense um, which you know, can take you through a whole bunch of uh, different things you can do to protect your privacy from how to use encrypted apps, how to use a VPN, how to encrypt your hard drive, all sorts of things. But it all kind of boils down to uh, a process called um, you know, doing a, a threat analysis for yourself, figuring out what kind of information you have, uh, you know, what might somebody, you know, who might want to get it from you, what's the worst case situ situ scenario when it, if it were to get out there, how much, uh, uh, pain are you willing to go through to protect that data and just sort of thinking that through and then making whatever choices are right for you. Um, for most people, you know, it's, well, my sensitive medical records or my financial data and my biggest threat is just somebody hacking me and stealing my identity. And that just is generally for most people, you know, most people's grandmothers are not, you know, um, except for maybe, you know, our, our hiker activists, but most people's, you know, grandmothers don't have to worry about Russian hackers going after their, their data. Um, but you know, a lot of people do find uh, the sheer amount of information we have out there to be daunting, it to be just you know overwhelming to go to our site and go through it and trying to figure out, oh my gosh, I want to protect my privacy and there's like a million things and suddenly I've got like 20 different apps that are you know designed to do my privacy on my phone and I'm not actually getting any work done because I'm spending all my time you know fiddling with with controls. Um, you know, I think that generally we so. You know, when we do outreach to the general public as opposed to people who actually reach out and looking for trainings, we kind of have some like low bar things that we want to get across. And those are things like enabling two-factor authentication across your social media uh, accounts or using a password manager to generate strong passwords and to have them in a place that you can remember them on so you're not just reusing, you know, um, you know password one, two, three over and over and over again. Um, one of my favorite things that we did uh, last year for education, it was the first time for me working with, um, with uh, young people, is there's this conference called Dragon Con in Atlanta, Georgia. It's generally like a fantasy science fiction convention. It's well known for having a lot of cosplay and a lot of stars, but weirdly, for the last like 15 years or so, they've had like a track within the conference uh, named after the Electronic Frontier Foundation. It's the Electronic Frontiers Forums, and it actually is like a mini digital rights conference within this fantasy conference. And so every year that we go, we man a table, and we try to do some sort of public outreach campaign uh, that is themed towards science fiction and fantasy. And so for a few years, we would have like a cosplay photo booth where you showed up in your costume, and we took a picture of you holding like a digital rights sign or something that says like, you know, it's called Project Secret Identity. Um, a couple years later, we wanted to defend net neutrality, and so we built, people watch Doctor Who at all? 
Any Doctor Who? There we go, we got a Doctor Who fan. Uh, so we, we built a TARDIS, like a full-size cardboard TARDIS that people could go and, uh, which is like this phone booth that travels in time and space and stuff. I, I don't want to go too deep into Doctor Who uh, uh, mythology here, but you could use it to call your member of Congress from this phone booth to demand t net neutrality. But my favorite is what we did this last year. And uh, the idea was to explain the concepts of strong passwords to people, and particularly to kids. And we have this thing, that, this method for making a, a strong password uh, that's called diceware. And generally, diceware involves using a bunch of six-sided dice and a word list of randomized like, words that are easy to remember but are all unique. And you roll the dice and you, you know, write down the word and then you roll the dice again and you write down the word, like you match the numbers to the words on the word list. And we decided to change that for a fantasy audience. Um, so instead of six-sided die, we used 20-sided role-playing dice, right? Like the, the kind that you might use in Dungeons and Dragons. But we didn't think that was good enough on its own, so we were able to find online these giant inflatable 20-sided dice. They were like this big, and so we had three of them. Um, and we didn't think that was enough even still, so we created word lists that were themed for various fandoms. So we had a Harry Potter word list, we had a Star Wars word list, we had a Star Trek word list, and we had a Game of Thrones word list, although the Game of Thrones word list was not for kids. Uh, the other ones were. And so the idea was we had a worksheet, and you know, people, you know, these kids could see our giant 20-sided die from like all the way across like the exhibition hall. And they would come over and be like, what's up with these 20-sided, like, what's going on, can I throw them? And we're like, yeah, but you have to like make a password with them. And so we had like a worksheet, and we'd say like, what do you like, Star Wars, Harry Potter? And kids would be like, Harry Potter, I love Harry Potter. And we'd show them, and they would, you know, take these three big dice, and they'd throw them across the floor, and they would find the, they would go into our word list, and they would find their Harry Potter word, and they put it down, and they would do that, you know, three to five times, depending on how old the kid was, and then they had to make a sentence with those words to help them remember their words, and then at the end, they got their own little series of dice. But um, I have never seen, like, a four-year-old, like, erupt with enthusiasm over a password. Like... But, it, but seriously, we'd have like four or five year olds come to him and be like, oh, this is so great, can I throw it? And they would not want to stop making passwords because it was so fun to throw these 20 sided dice. So that's, that's an example of like one thing that we've tried that was really successful. Yes. <laughs> and this is actually why we have said that, that, we, that we aren't doing such work because there is so great work by the, by the EFF, um, and it's really hard to do such educational work because you have to really have the the tech. You have the tech. You have to have tech uh, knowledges in your team. You have to you have to be communication experts on your team, and therefore, it's, I think it's really important that you are you're doing something like this because this is something we are also. We are also using it. I think it's like one of the global. It's one of the global resources, um, and I even think that this can be done also by uh, universities, for example. This educational work, it can be even done by some sort of public authorities if they are. Mm, neutral enough to educate people on this issue, like what is a secure password, how to handle a password manager, how to install PGP on your email address and all that stuff. That isn't something which isn't any longer as it was maybe eight years ago or so really tricky sometimes. It's now even easy and it, and it, and it can even become uh, more easier. So I think this is a really important thing and I think really that we have to do outreach work on this to so really uh, 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 go out on the on the on the uh, on the uh, street and educate people on this issue. And I think they are really asking for it. It's not like a, oh my gosh, it's it is an interesting me, but, but they have no idea how to do it. And there is no one in their a uh, 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 family who they can ask 
So I am also still in my own political party, that person who gets at night a, a signal message, even they are on signal, which is like really good because I'm not on uh, WhatsApp, so they had to use a, a, a signal contact and say, I have here a problem, can you help me with this and this and this? Because people have no idea how it works sometimes. And that's like that, but then you have to help them. And I think this is something all of us has to work on. And the third question was the drone case. Um, actually, how should I say it? Um, I think we have to think about how, how much self-defense is OK in that case. Um, we also had some actions in Germany where, where uh, people were this, uh, this uh, you're drawing private surveillance cameras who also who also who also who also monitored public space. This those person had to pay a fine after the after the uh, court sentence. But I think what we have to understand, and that's also something of uh, your awareness rising, that people understand there is a private in uh, infringement also. And uh, your drones don't maybe become the usual suspect yet, but especially video surveillance is in Germany really a large problem because they are so cheap now. So everyone has them and they are just out in uh, front of shops. They are monitoring the whole street actually, which the police wouldn't be allowed to, private persons are uh, 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 doing it. And there is a really funny story in Germany, like four or five years old, that there was a surveillance camera by, uh, 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 museum and it was like one of these high fancy cameras it can zoom and huh? and they realized after a couple of years that they had that they could have monitored and even they had monitored the private apartment of Angela Angela Merkel for like three years this surveillance camera, if they realized it, it was out after, I don't know, three <laughs> hours maybe. But this was really what got attention in Germany because they said, why hasn't the German police thought that there was a huge camera always looking into the, into the windows of the private apartment of Angela Merkel? And that shows that you really have to protect yourself and that you have to openly see around you if there are such things who can infringe your privacy. Um, I forgot there was a drone question, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about that for a second too. Um, so yeah, this is a really contentious area and I don't, you know, the, because we deal a lot with police surveillance drones and we're definitely, you know, have a lot of concerns about police surveillance drones, but at the same time, we have to recognize that drones are, you know, can be very, very useful for news gathering, for filmmaking, and so we have to look very carefully at rules that try to regulate them. Um, particularly in the U.S., because so often the rules that uh, are are try, that people try to enact are not necessarily about uh, protecting people's privacy, but they're often related to um, going after. Uh, to keep like animal rights activists from filming slaughterhouses or filming factory farms or environmental groups who are trying to capture footage of, um, you know, of, of you know, environmental disasters or things like that. And so we definitely know, I mean, we definitely see that some of the times they'll make the argument, oh, this is about privacy, but really it's about corporations or it's about chilling you know, uh, some sort of speech. And so there has to be like a, a, a balance there. One of the, the stories that kind of, uh, that makes me chuckle from time to time is, um, so Senator Dianne Feinstein has been in the Senate for a long time. She's involved with a lot of defense related uh, activities. 
and um, there's this anti-war group called Code Pink that um, decided to um, stage an event outside of her house, and her house in San Francisco is actually like there's almost like a public park right in front of it that is like her like front yard is like part of this like staircase that I don't know it, it's it's a heavily trafficked like tourist destination her house, but they they started flying a drone up to her window and trying to peek in her window and she will tell this story like during discussions about drones how she opened her window and there was a drone and she got really freaked out, um, so it's. It's, I mean, it's, I don't exactly know what to do in that situation because like on one hand, yeah, I'm very concerned about drones going and peeping inside other people's windows. On the other hand, the, to me, this was a, a legitimate political activity. They were trying to bring attention to predator drones that were bombing people overseas and their method of doing that was to put a drone in Death Senator Feinstein's front yard. Um, but I don't know. I don't know what to deal with that. I mean, it's it's hard. Uh, one thing I would keep an eye out for to see if it starts being um, exported to Brazil is a product called Drone Shield, and this is a company that makes. Uh, I'm gonna make another like sci-fi reference. People ever watch the Men in Black? like shows, okay, and you know there's these big like cartoon guns? So the drone shield looks like one of those. It looks like a giant, giant like men in black gun. Um, and it uh, disrupts the, um, the signals of drones that basically take them out of the sky. They're actually illegal in the United States. And I was at a presentation at a police chief's conference where somebody was asking about these uh, products and someone from the Federal Communications Commission that regulates, you know, radio waves stood up and said, listen, if anybody tries to sell this to your police department, come and see me because we're going to shut it down. This is not something that works. But Drone Shield is very good about marketing their product uh, outside of the United States. And so I don't know if they're trying to sell it here, but I would keep an eye out for it. Um, we, and to sort of circle back to legislation, you know, one of the things that we look at are government entities that try to give themselves the power to intercept those signals between you know, a drone signal. And we have to remind people that drones are devices just like anything else, like any other, you know, they have cameras on them. They are being, uh, you know, they are often controlled by your phone or some similar computer tablet. Um, and so by, you know, if you pass a law that says that, you know, a government entity can, can interfere with the signal between a drone and a tablet, you're essentially telling the government entity they can access your tablet. So. Eu queria, a gente tem falado bastante de campanhas de conscientização, de educação, etc. Eu queria falar um pouco sobre o papel dos jornalistas, especialmente considerando a experiência acadêmica do Dave como jornalista. É, a gente uh, no Internet Lab já tentou ou tem pensado em estratégias de como talvez engajar os jornalistas uh, no Brasil ou na América Latina a cobrir os temas de políticas de internet de uma maneira um pouco mais investigativa ou um pouco diferente. Né? E a gente fez isso há dois anos atrás, a gente organizou uma escola de jornalistas, a gente trouxe diversos especialistas, a ProPublica uh, mandou uma pessoa para cá e tal. Uh, e a gente reuniu um grupo de 10 jornalistas brasileiros, 10 jornalistas de outros países da América Latina, uh, num programa de duas semanas para que uh, a cobertura por parte dos jornalistas endereçasse alguns temas de uh, políticas de tecnologia. Né? Uh, e... Paralelamente a isso, a gente assiste constantemente a cobertura da imprensa, da mídia, em relação a esse sistema, sendo muito capturada por uma agenda, uma agenda de inovação. E aí eu dou alguns exemplos. Né? Então, ontem, por exemplo, eu participei de um programa ao vivo para discutir questões ligadas à internet e o tema era pedofilia. Né? Então, é, é sempre, de novo, a gente volta nessa narrativa do medo. Uh, um outro exemplo é a forma como a imprensa cobriu a, a, os experimentos com reconhecimento facial durante o carnaval. Né? Tudo que saiu na imprensa foi o número de criminosos que foram presos por causa do uso dessa tecnologia. E aí, fazendo um paralelo de novo com uma experiência minha, é, eu dei uma entrevista para o Estadão em que eles estavam testando no celular da Huawei que tem um zoom de 50 vezes. Né? e o Super Zoom. E eles ficaram me perguntando se não deveria então existir uma lei que proibisse o uso desse celular do Super Zoom, porque então agora 
o seu vizinho ia ficar espiando você. Eu falei, é, mas essa não é uma questão tão importante. Tem outras questões de vigilância, de reconhecimento facial, etc. E a jornalista insistiu três vezes, né? mas não tem mesmo que ter uma lei. Ah, então, assim, quando essas questões surgem, eu falei, não, já existe a cortina. Você fecha a cortina, esse problema está resolvido, tem outras coisas. Né? É, mas acho que é isso. Assim, como é que a gente pensa em estratégias para engajar ou capacitar os jornalistas para cobrir esses temas de uma maneira mais é, informativa. Um, well, it, it's always, I mean, the all right. So on a positive note, like most journalists fall into that category of people who care about things um, because it's not a particularly lucrative career that you go into for money or anything else. It's usually you know, fame or you care about things. And so you're already like on a good path with, with journalists who care, care about things. Um, that said, um, there are lots of journalists who just eat up whatever they're told and don't want to question it and aren't going to scrutinize. And that doesn't, we're not talking about that necessarily being surveillance, that being all, you know, all issues. That if somebody sends a press release, they write up the press release without actually researching it. Um, and I don't necessarily know how to change the overall culture of journalism and those problems. Um, What I can say is that one of the shifts we've seen over the last like five or six years is seeing uh, specifically the tech and the tech business press uh, and engaging with them on these issues. That taking the folks who are not necessarily the TV reporters who are just trying to you know, cover the crime of the day and you know, you know, do the quick 30 second bite, but the folks who are, are covering technological issues, the people who are covering the new iPhone, the people who are covering you know, uh, you know, all, all sorts of like technological issues and making them, engaging them and thinking, saying criminal justice is a tech issue and turning tech, tech reporters into also tech and criminal justice reporters or tech and human rights reporters. And I think that that has worked a lot. I think that when you look at the tech press in the United States, uh, the tech press in the United States has become very much an activist press right these days. They understand the, the importance of encryption and they will argue for it. And anytime somebody wants to challenge encryption, they will write about it very hard. Um, they are very easy, you know, quick to, to realize that privacy is a tech issue. and. Any story that comes up that implicates privacy, they will write about it. And I think that that it, you know, uh, for bang for your buck, if you're reaching out to the press, reaching out to the tech press, and trying to convert that rather than your day-to-day -day TV reporters. I don't know. I mean, it's hard though because the TV reporters reach the most amount of people, but they often don't necessarily put the amount of work in. Um, but that said, in the U.S., we do have a lot of TV reporters who recognize the dangers of a lot of this technology and realize they can make a good, quick hit at, off of it. Um, particularly, Facebook is like the big bogeyman right now, and so it's very easy for them to do reports on Facebook all the time. And I hope that the outcome of a lot of these. Um, a lot of this sort of social media privacy driven coverage helps pay more attention to the other forms that are going on with law enforcement. Um, I, I, this is the first I've heard about somebody trying to pro prohibit phones with super zooms. Um, I, that makes me very, very nervous. Anything that would pro prohibit somebody from taking a photograph makes me nervous. And so I, I don't have uh, any other opinions other than it makes me very anxious and I don't, I would want there to be a lot of deliberation about whether that's actually a good idea or not. Uh, journalists, I think journalists are a partner, as you said, also for our cases. Um, we've seen in Germany a situation that there has been some uh, trainings for them. It, it's more about training on their own IT security and, and then they have an idea about the whole issue and then some of them are even more interested to uh, cover these issues afterwards uh, and there are some specified or, or uh, specialized journalists where we just, where I wouldn't say partner for our work but they are quite helpful for our work and we also have in several cases we have journalists as uh, your plaintiffs and this is also helpful because that shows other journalists that they can also be maybe affected by it. So we we you quite often use this uh, freedom of the press angle in our cases as an add-on to attract especially journalists to it because if there is a journalist as a plaintiff, then the journalist 
unions are talking about it on social media and those are like all the uh, uh, all the uh, followers of them are also journalists itself so they get to know about it so that's really helpful I, I to have sometimes journalists like uh, as extra plaintiffs just to uh, show it um, and on your second point with uh, super zooming cameras I think it's like in in the past your your neighbor could also buy this huge gigantic uh, telescope or something like that. Um, I think we cannot regulate always the technology itself because it's like uh, like kind of a dual used technology. It can be used for something really nice and smart, and it can be used for something evil, like always. And I think it's more important that you maybe start a public discussion on it, why it's not helpful if you use your new, your new smartphone with a, with a, with a, with a super zoom to like uh, looking into your neighbor's windows or to look at someone on the beach or so on. And so, but I think this is like also how society has to learn how to handle new technology. You cannot always say to them, no, 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 no. You also have to give them the way to experience it and also to understand it, also to make failures and also even sometimes maybe uh, turn them over to the poor, poor, poor police if they do something awful with it. But I, I think uh, if we start always at the beginning when there is something new to say, no, that's not good, we have to uh, regulate it, I think that's not really helpful because that can at the end maybe not uh, be helpful at all because then there is like the one part of society who is like really techno-optimistic and the other half is like really technophobic and says, oh, it's new, I have to regulate it. Even if I would argue always technology, especially the digital technology, is something cool actually. But you have to use it in the right way and you have to help people to help people to use it like that and only if this only if you see there is that there is a misuse, then you have to go, 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 go in. Se alguém tiver mais alguma pergunta, vamos fazer uma rodada. Aí pode vir aqui também, e aí eles respondem e a gente encerra por causa do tempo. Mais alguém? Aí a gente faz uma rodada de três perguntas. Ninguém mais? Três então. É, olá. Eu gostaria de saber se vocês, qual a opinião de vocês, na verdade, sobre e democracia e cidadania, é, se vocês acham que é um conflito que pode surgir nessas, com essas iniciativas de democracia e cidadania, e se esse conflito ele é evitável, é, quais seriam os pontos de conflito e quais, e quais seriam as possíveis soluções de equilíbrio? Could, um, could, um... Could you, could you d d um, sort of define what you're talking about with e-democracy and e-citizenship? Ah, sim. E-democracia, por exemplo, consulta pública digital sobre projetos legislativos. E-cidadania, identidade digital, por exemplo. Plataformas que nós, nós temos aqui no Brasil, acredito que alguns outros governos também têm, é, para fomentar a democracia no meio digital, uma democracia direta e, no caso da cidadania, o um acesso a serviços públicos de uma forma melhor por ser digital. Você falou sobre o trabalho jornalista, você disse que mais dos dados que vão para o governo vêm de empresas privadas private uh, private enterprises so how the journalist work gets harder or easier gathering information from these corporations or is it easier to gather information from corporations than it is from the government um, 
Okay, so on the uh, the first question, sorry, am I on? Did it pop off? There we go. So um, related to, to, if I understand correctly, with, with e-democracy, the idea of having platforms that allow for better citizen engagement on issues, I'm, I'm a big fan of those. Um, what I'm less of a fan of is seeing um, government move to Facebook and other platforms as their primary um, form of communicating with, with agencies. I've started to see government, I mean with the public, I've started to see government agencies just not even have websites anymore, just have a Facebook page. And that scares like the hell out of me because we're talking about a platform that is suddenly becoming the negotiating power between, you know, the, the, the rules of the platform are, you know, governing your interaction with government as opposed to having a direct connection to it. So I actually do like to see, um, uh, when governments have abilities for uh, people to uh, uh, you know, send their feedback on legislation or to contact their representatives. I find that a generally a positive thing. Um, uh, I know that for, for our work, um, since we do a lot of digital activism campaigns where we have people use our online tool to send letters to members of Congress or to city councils, and it does make it a lot easier for us to build our tools as long as they can interface with their tools. Um, and so I think that on the whole, that's really good. Um, with issues related to e-citizenship and digital services, it's kind of a mixed bag because there are so many privacy and security issues that go into that and that oftentimes agencies will not think those through. They'll just be like, oh, it'll be great if we make this available, but we're not gonna protect people's, um, you know, we're not gonna, you know, you know, shore up the security firewalls for the system to keep the data from getting out there. Or they'll say, well, we're gonna share this data with third parties without really telling people about it, and that's just, it can be a, a total nightmare. And so I, the, on the, so that second e-citizenship, I would wade very carefully into that if I was in the government. I'm gonna save the second question. I think maybe we should deal with the first question and then come back to the second one. Um, the e-citizenship or like this whole stuff of e, 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 e government at all, I would say, <laughs> we have a special situation in Germany. We have to say we have a, actually we have a pretty organized system, but it's so secure and so many extra add-ons that uh, nobody is actually using it. And I think the biggest failure was that they co uh, co uh, enacted this EID card with your regular ID card. And so uh, people felt uncomfortable that they had to hand out or like uh, take, their, take their regular ID card always and hold it against your, your, uh, 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 your uh, 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 smartphone, for example. So I always argued, why are we not having like an extra EID card where there isn't all the information of your regular ID card on, just the information you want to have, like your name or age or maybe your address, up, up uh, to the issues you, are, you, 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 uh, you want to use it for. Uh, but they always wanted to have it so close connected to, to, to to the normal ID card, and therefore, even if it's implemented, I have to say that it is quite secure, and really nobody uses this because there is like this abstract fear that then they can have access like to all the information on your ID card, also your eye color and your height and and so on. And uh, so I think this is this this uh, 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 shows sometimes, or I think it's a really good example that shows even if you have a quite positive stand on uh, privacy and IT security, if you don't see about like the like the easiest thing, if the if the people would allow to use such a card then it isn't handled upon because then really nobody, nobody uses it in Germany. Even not the public authorities are offering it anymore 
even if it costs billions actually to implement it. Um, so this is a really good example, I think, and, and, and it started 2011, I think. So it's a really good example that shows how to do something like that really wrong. Um, yeah, and the, and the second one about uh, journalists, private companies, what is easier? Um, I would say it is easier to find a kind of internal person like a whistleblower from a, a private company as from a, as from a police agency, for example. Um, so th 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 that is maybe a shift because private company employees are sometimes mm, much more open to, to uh, speak with you on issues than there are people from the police or the intelligence agencies, for example. Um, at the same time, it's a really big problem that they are not underlying, for example, freedom of information re requests. So you cannot just ask the company to hand you out information because they say, no, we are not a public authority. So, so that even at the same time also makes it more uh, difficult. So it's a little bit split up, I would say. Um, I would say without hesitation, it is easier to get information from the government in, in the United States, in the United States at least. Um, uh, and it's because you can file freedom of information requests and demand information from them. And if they don't give it to them, you, you can sue them. You can, uh, you, know, you know, government entities are, um, uh, you know, ultimately they, their constituency is the public. And so um, even if they don't answer you at first, the more public pressure is, the more there is on, uh, on them to actually come forward. They do have to get elected uh, uh, from time to time. And so these questions can come up with debates. And, you know, if one person won't say anything, the opponent will force them to say something or say something uh, alternative. Um, with companies, they have no obligation to talk to you ever or to give you any kind of information whatsoever. And then when they give you information, generally they're not obligated to give you the truth unless it's like not false advertising or misrepresenting certain things. Um, oftentimes I have found it harder to get whistleblowers from companies because uh, government entities can't make their employees sign non-disclosure agreements, but companies frequently do more and more now. And so you'll have a person who even after they've left a company for many years still can't tell you anything about that because they are legally obligated not to talk to you about it. Um, but I've had companies that uh, I have reported on their interactions and they have denied and called me fake news and called me a liar and threatened to sue us. And then later on it turned out that I was completely right and totally vindicated. I mean, there's nothing I can really do about it. I mean, I guess maybe we could like consider like suing them for like libel or something, but we're not going to do that because we think libel laws uh, are abused enough as is. Um, but uh, I find though that as an advocacy organization, so aside from so that's the problem with, with journalists. Like journalists have a lot of hard, like a very difficult time, obviously getting getting honest answers and information from companies. Uh, another thing that's difficult is that you'll have journalists who decide or who they, because they do not have this ability to get information from particularly tech companies, uh, will start trying to find alternative means of getting that information. So for example, that might be ProPublica uh, testing Facebook's algorithm by creating a bunch of profiles or scraping a system uh, to get information. And you'll see a company go after these journalists, accusing them of, of like criminal hacking for doing you know, you know, technological, you know, computer-based reporting. And so that's another challenge that, that they have to face. Um, although for an advocacy organization, we do have the ability often to have very good dialogues with some of the larger tech companies. Um, one of the projects that we do um, uh, every year is something called Who Has Your Back, which started off with us evaluating companies on how they protect users' data from government requests. Um, now it's more about uh, censorship issues, but you know, we've kind of changed over the years. But generally, um, um, uh, we have found that tech companies are very similar to like, like young children in that you can <laughs> give them gold stars or not gold stars for things and they will change their practices in order to get gold stars. So with government practices, we had like a whole series of things that we wanted these companies to do. Require a warrant, 
publish your law enforcement guidelines online, you know, tell Congress, you know, stand up for user rights in Congress, and they would get a gold star if they did all of these things. And so we would tell them in advance each year, you know, these are what the criteria is going to be. Currently, you're going to get zero stars, or you're going to get one star, and they'd be like in this like race against each other to get as many stars as possible because they don't want to be the because when we we pu publish it like the tech press writes about our like ratings for the year the tech press always goes for who got the least amount of stars and that's their headline like you know x company you know failed and got zero stars and so they don't, never want to be that company and so they actually like compete with each other and actually change their policies and so we're able to get a lot of engagement that way through these kinds of like rankings of things um, but you know that's you know we're an advocacy organization and journalist organizations don't always get Get that sort of treatment. É, no Brasil, o Internet Lab é, em parceria com a IFF faz uma versão do Quem Defende Seus Dados, é um Reserve Back, a gente chama de Quem Defende Seus Dados. Quem quiser saber mais sobre o projeto, o site é quem defende seus dados.org.br. A gente foca aqui essa análise nos provedores de conexão à internet. Então, Vivo, Net, Claro, Oi. É, e quem quiser saber qual é a melhor ou qual é a pior, de acordo com a nossa avaliação, quem ganhou mais ou menos estrelas, está lá nos relatórios. Uh, a pior é a net, claro, mas enfim. É, uh, eu queria agradecer muito uh, o Dave e o Malter por essa ótima conversa. Eu acho que uh, a gente no Brasil ainda uh, tem um caminho longo e difícil na construção assim, de uh, uma experiência sólida na, na utilização do litígio estratégico para direitos digitais. Uh, acho que isso uh, é um terreno muito arenoso ainda e que deve ser feito com bastante parcimônia esse tipo de estratégia utilizado, porque uh, a gente pode, no final, ter precedentes ou uh, resultados não tão bons. Mas é uma coisa que a gente tem uh, pensado bastante. Eu acho que esse tipo de conversa que traz perspectivas e experiências de outros países, de outros contextos, é super relevante. É, a gente vai disponibilizar o vídeo depois, é, provavelmente já legendado, então talvez demore um pouquinho. Uh, o vídeo vai estar disponível nos nossos canais do Internet Lab, no Facebook, no nosso canal no YouTube. Procurem. Uh, e agradecer a presença de todos que ficaram aqui, que participaram. Uh, e é isso. Uh, fiquem ligados nas atividades do NDIS uh, e do Internet Lab. E até a próxima. Obrigado. <risos>